Um, last time I checked, um, operations usually doesn't like release all the code all at once and change everything once a year. Um, if you do, ow, I'm sorry, that sounds rough. Um, so operations is a really good fit for this sort of approach where you're constantly um, pulling in changes, validating, making sure they work, and then going live. So <coughs> let's actually keep ahead with my slides instead of me going really far ahead. So continuous integration is terribly powerful um, for this sort of approach where, um, let's say you make a change. You write your tests, whatever, and then you push it into some sort of CI pipeline. Maybe you submit a pull request and use Travis CI. Um, maybe you use GitLab and use a merge request or something like that, um, and so forth. Instead of um, directly merging things in, um, that change goes through some sort of validation first. It gets tested, it gets linted or something like that. Like, you know that one coworker that either you like spaces and they like, like, they like tabs or vice versa and you, they constantly do what you don't want them to? This is how you stop it. No more. Um, so as part of your process, you do basic unit testing or some sort of acceptance testing or something like that. You do linting and if um, Rob keeps using hard tabs, then um, you DOS his box and reject the uh, commit or something like that. Um, but you have a process where you can say, it is part of your core workflow of, um, you cannot bypass it, it is not, you can't forget to do it, you can't accidentally merge things in. As if, like, this is a core part of your workflow where you have guarantees that, I mean, if it, is, um, if it passes CI, you can merge it. So this is actually really cool because you can be like, I don't know, let's see if it works. It'll pass CI if, if it does. Oh, that failed horribly. Um, it's kind of the throw it against the wall and see what sticks approach, but this is really powerful. Now you don't have to obsess about doing everything just right the first time. Um, it's actually a lot of fun. Um, uh, when I uh, started in development, it, it, it I found out how much freedom this actually gave us because I mean, I could I could try more things, I could be experimental, I could take a lot of risks, and it was okay. This also gives you another advantage of, yeah, this always earns, earns me brownie points. I'll see brownie points if someone remembers the uh, alt text to this one, but so uh, like as, I'm sorry? Okay, okay, I would be deeply, deeply impressed if you could. Um, but so as part of this process, like, as I've been kind of um, driving this point, um, or driving towards this point, w operations in a traditional go and set it up and do this manual labor process, this is going to go away. It is um, given by the fact that we've been automating everything in, um, in our society for the last 500 years or so. Um, we're all gonna be developers at some point. Um, or pretty uh, pretty close to it. So um, we're gonna be writing code, we're gonna be making changes, and so you know that feeling when you're trying to work on something? I'm like, you make a change, and you wait five minutes. And it fails, and you make a change, and you wait five minutes. It is a horrible process, and you're constantly being interrupted. And so you want to make sure that you can actually get really good feedback really quickly about what's going on, and CI can give you this. Um, Basically, instead of like deploying code right away, you can do all sorts of validation um, up front. Like, once again, linting is very quick. Doing basic unit testing is very quick. Um, standing up in, um, maybe a cluster of VMs will take a while, but you can layer things incrementally so that you can, um, you can get feedback as quickly as, you, as possible. Um, you catch as many failures as, as quickly as you can. And so using a process like that where you layer these tests using CI, um, your cycle time between testing, like uh, making a change and testing it out can be seconds instead of minutes or hours. I saw this on Twitter a while ago and I had to slip it in. Um, so fun fact, um, uh, Jenkins actually uh, traditionally has um, blue as the, the successful value. This apparently comes from, um, I believe it was Japan where streetlights used to be blue, turned to green for some reason, but yeah. So um, I was talking about having some sort of testing system and having, some, like if you have a, a, a separate monitoring system and a separate, separate uh, testing system, you can get this lovely thing where, yeah, Jenkins is totally happy. Like, whatever tests you did there are great. And Nagios is crashing and burning and your infrastructure is rolling over. So, um, oh, I'm so happy to see that, by the way. Cool, I'm not completely running out of time. <laughs> All right. Um, unfortunately, I totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> oh, no, totally fine. Oh, I have, like, the attention span of, like, a small, young squirrel. So, if you take this approach of your CI is the way that you get things done and the same things are being used, for your monitoring, um, 
you get to this lovely state where I will actually phrase this in an inflammatory manner. You can't work if it's broken. This is really good because let's say the server over here is failing and like yeah, you should fix it, but you don't really want to. Um, in a lot of development um, practices, the build must always be green. You must, wait, Felix? Hi, I recognize you. Like I said, I have no attention span. Um, <laughs> you didn't believe me, did you? Um, so with continuous integration and this sort of workflow, the build must stay green. Um, if something goes right, you cannot merge new changes, you cannot add things on top of it, you have to fix it right then and there. This keeps you accountable. It can be painful when it's like this stupid server that Bob will not attend to, um, and he's breaking your important work, but it means that Bob better get his shit together or um, his laptop is going to be like put in like a block of ice or something like this. But it is a good thing to make sure you keep on top of your system. Um, show of hands, how many questions do we have right now? Because I can keep rambling. Questions? I'm sorry? Hats? Hats. I'm sorry? Hands, hands, oh, okay. I am slightly deaf, so bear with me. Okay, cool. That means I get to flip in my cum uh, Benedict Cumberbatch uh, reference. So the last thing I'm gonna ramble on is basically how like things will crash and burn. You like you will miss something. You will um, write some code. You'll have tests, and everything will look fine. And like maybe it's one out of every ten requests or something like that. But you will slip in subtle problems into your environment, um, and you're gonna have to go through and debug it. Like this is a common thing. But I found that we don't do a great great job of stressing like how to effectively like work through problems like this. So this section is completely like. I don't have any neat code snippets to show you. I don't have things like this, this um, because technical, slash, um, technical solutions are a lot of fun. I mean, they're you gotta write green full code and you gotta like solve a problem your way and it makes for a great presentation. Um, and if you solve a social problem with a technical solution, you're de like, you're probably exacerbating the problem and hiding it. I've seen this too frequently, Shot de shotgun debugging. Thing goes down. Why did it go down? I don't know, it could be this, this, and this. Let's change them all. Done it many times. And so maybe like the only thing worse than something breaking and you not knowing why is something now working and you not knowing why because you don't know what went right. It is a scary situation to be in. And so it, yeah, avoid that. Sherlocking. I've also seen this one where it's like, okay, well this thing is going down. Or this thing, the service has gone down. Let's think about everything that went, uh, that happened. Think about it really hard, and we're gonna uh, make some deductions. So first off, none of you are Sherlock, and none of you are dreamy enough to be Sherlock. I'm sorry, but none of you are uh, Benedict Cumberbatch. So in this sort of environment, I mean, if something goes wrong, how much can you reduce this problem down? I mean, how many things can you pull out of the equation? How much can you simplify a problem and get it just down to the core issue? Um, probably when you, like, file a bug report on some sort of um, pro uh, project, it's like you're gonna see some devs saying, well, can you re reproduce this and what's the minimal reproducible case? It makes li our lives so much easier. I mean, when you can say, here is just enough to reproduce this and it works great in many environments too. Um, in operations, we have so many moving parts. I mean, if you've got a network issue, I mean, maybe it's the cable, maybe it is um, the routing protocol, maybe it is spanning seed protocol. So really, figure out how much you can reduce the problem and simplify things. And in the same manner of, once again, change one thing at a time, make incremental progress, figure out what you can do, deduce from, from the environment. How are you doing on time? We've got 10 minutes? Okay. Anyone wanna hear a story about how everything's terrible? Okay. Heart bleed. That was fun, huh? Everything really is terrible. So as part of the heart bleed remediation, um, so there's this thing that I'm not sure many people have heard of it. It's called Azure, Microsoft Azure. It's a hipster, hipster thing. Um, <laughs> and there's al this also thing that's called, um, what is it, Ubuntu. Yeah, that's it, Ubuntu. Um, Ubuntu. Um, so one of the things we did at Puppet Labs is we actually built a bunch of VMs that ran um, uh, on uh, Ubuntu on Microsoft Azure. Heartbleed came out and everybody's like, oh my God, we now have to do Heartbleed remediation, update OpenSSL and everything like that. And I think Canonical is partially at fault for this. So they're building these VMs. 
And um, so we have one we have one environment that works. This is before Heartbleed is in, is announced. Um, and it works. Things are great. We start doing Heartbleed remediation. We bring up um, a, a new environment with the updated canonical box. Hostname resolution breaks. That's strange. I mean, literally, the machine can no longer resolve its own hostname, or it gets like a mangled hostname. And it's, it's like, OK, well, what changed? Well, they actually have the same packages for like, it was ISC, DHCP client, same package. <coughs> OK, well, I mean, if it's the same package, I mean, what's happening on the actual wire? So, you know, bust out a uh, TCP dump and start sniffing DHCP client, uh, packets. Um, there's a really neat feature. Um, it's only in, or I only found out this is just in Ubuntu, where if you say like, in the DHCP CD clients config, um, there is what is it? Send hostname and then brackets hostname. Um, on the near machine, that string was literally being sent. On the old machine, it was actually the the hostname being inferred. But once again, like, why is this happening? It is the same package on both ones. Like, it is the same package number and things like that. MD5 in the binary, different results. First rule. If you ever rebuild a package with the same version number and change something, I will find you and I will down. <laughs> this was seriously like a good two weeks of work, and at the same time, we're trying to fix it. Oh God, just bump the version number. Um, it turns out that when um, they were working on this, oh, oh, this is also the fun thing too. They also shipped a different configure, like sa um, same package number, same, uh, um, but a different binary and a different configuration. Even more fun, the new configuration they pulled in was for the wrong version. So once again, my god, just bump the version number. Um, turns out what happened is with the uh, rebuilt version, they forgot to apply a patch. So in this sort of things, it's just, it is an iterative process of how, like, this should not have happened and it was bizarre, but I, it's the sort of like, how can we systematically prove or disprove what is going on? So, anyhow. I thought this was kind of cute. All right, I think I'm pretty low on time, which is awesome because, um, questions? <coughs> I'm sorry? <laughs> configuration management. Um, do, 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 do. Yes, that, that's it, configuration management. I've always wanted to do this, this is just like sit down in the front row and just talk to someone directly. Hi. Hi. Is this weird yet? Is this weird? Well, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's things like how does a developer work in the manner of like, how do like how do we do uh, um, change man change management like how do um, or I've seen such a drastic change in like how I and my colleagues wrote code um, uh, um, and and version things and like worked with, with each other and did uh, uh, things like that. This may have been for the f like the, the fact that we are a tiny startup with like three guys when when I started we actually it was um, Zach Len Leslie Ben Hughes and I and our manager, we saw him like once every six weeks. So it was kind of benevolent anarchy. Um, but I mean, we did not have these refined processes. We did not use CI effectively. You've seen my commit messages. Um, we did not have a very good way of testing things. It was kind of the, I hope it works and we might write some tests after it crashes and burns. And I never thought about applying like test-driven development and things like that. Um, reality is like we're going basically, we're all gonna be developers in some manner. Automation is going to basically, is changing everything, so. It's also a very exciting title, so it's a little bit clickbaity. All right, yes. Mm -hmm. um, git revert uh, dash that, dash that, or dash m. Oh God, why? Um, and git push. There are a couple of ways I've done some pro approaches. Uh, how we handle rollbacks, thank you. Um, so I've seen it a uh, done a couple of ways. Um, <laughs> one approach where you basically have, um, let's say you have some sort of like clustered service or some sort of like multi-node monstrosity that consumes roles or something like that. Two versions, um, as you do a rollout, you rotate them out via load balancer or something like that. When it what crashes and burns, swap them back. Um, if it's something smaller, hopefully you didn't change too much um, and you can revert, um, like just like undo your changes and then run the same configurations. Um, that is a tricky question, and uh, there's things like Nixoff that have some very interesting approaches to that, um, but rollback is inherently hard because um, you cannot unmake things, as far as I know. Um, it depends, which is an extremely wishy-washy answer, but that's what I've got. Anything else? Yes? Um, are those test actual examples? Uh, how far do those uh, test 
I have a big stick of gum here. Mm -hmm. Let's see. It's a meager way of grabbing the little small. Mm -hmm. We have uh, three possibilities of flavoring. The first is uh, some back air on the configuration side. Mm -hmm. Directly. Mm -hmm. Then uh, more of a feedback air on the, the, the fruity top, and then mm -hmm. perhaps some sensation, mm -hmm. some bad style transition. Mm -hmm. And then the, the thing stops and runs mm -hmm. for a certain amount of mm -hmm. time, and then it starts using mm -hmm. just this um, input. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> very b so the question that was asked is h um, how do you actually test things or what do you test? Um, is that a good summarization? Um, and so for, yeah, different failure modes. Um, the biggest thing is um, when you're doing testing, test the, uh, the desired, like the interface or the, the stuff that you care about. Like with the Apache example, I could have totally skipped the, like the service running. I mean, I could have just said, make sure the port's running and possibly grab a web page and make sure it works. Um, so a couple, fa a couple failure cases mentioned, you've got a uh, configuration file syntax error, Apache will not start. That's great, your port not, will not be open. Um, configuration is correct, but like the server won't start, same thing, port will not be open. Um, for the case where you have, uh, you crash on a certain input, and we'll keep running your tests. But um, that's for a long, or a, I would say that's, let's call that a Heisen bug, where it may or may not happen. Um, but I mean, there's not a lot you can do for something you don't have a guaranteed crash for, but active monitoring in, in, that, like, in that regard. But that's a good thing to mention is, when you're doing testing, Test the stuff you care about. Do not test the implementation. Um, the service example was a little bit contrived. It's kind of cute, um, but you do have the aspect of it doesn't matter because if the port is not open, well, I could rant on this a little bit more, but basically test the behavior you care about, not the exact implementation. Because like once again, if you switch to Nginx, your stuff's gonna, like your tests are gonna crash and burn, but you, everything could be working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The first issue, the mm -hmm. configuration side, is the mm -hmm. command based off a, a Vega script mm -hmm. uh, It was what so, um, JavaScript and XML. Did I hear that right? <laughs> Would you like a hug? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's really like. Uh, I don't want to give uh, my back feedback. I feedback, but I will give you a hug later. Um, in some manner, like test the contents of the file and basically do some sort of like, uh, is this React or something? Okay. Um, effectively, whatever manner you would do to like. Do you have a way of actually just like uh, doing that parse without actually changing anything? I or just manually run a test to add a different configuration file. Um, run a command and make sure the output is like zero or something like that? Um, we can talk more about that in a specific case later, but um, <laughs> at the same uh, manner too, I mean, you could say send up the service, like in, in, on a test environment, send up the service, if it crashes and burns, then somebody made a whoopsie. Um, I've got like two minutes, one minute left. One, okay, really quick question, what do we got? Our spec Nagios for matter. Um, so it is with our spec. You can you can um, you can say that my f like when I run a test, if it fails, put, give me an F. If it passes, give me a dot. Um, you have there's a test format editor called um, NANCAT for for matter, which is awesome. Like it will give you a NANCAT when it's running. It's great. Um, and in the same manner with the our spec Nagios for matter, it just runs tests and formats out uh, uh, accordingly. All right. Um, let's just cut it off now. All right. Thank you.